All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I see we have some people filing in nice and early on a Friday morning. It is a pleasure to be here today and to be able to talk with all of you. Um, I, you know, I've given this talk quite a few times. And to be frank, it's always been very centered around WordPress because that is typically the CMS of choice that I use. But I am uh, thrilled to be able to present this to a group of just uh, general CMS uh, enthusiasts and to be ta talking to other people of different technologies. That's very exciting for me. Um, so we're gonna dive in and get started. Uh, the, this talk today is really gonna focus on what I do in my role in selling a CMS when I'm working with enterprise clients. And I believe that enterprise clients are really a special breed of people um, and I've cultivated some tips and tricks over the years that I use when I'm working with them. So let's get into this presentation now. So who am I and what do I do and why am I here? Well, the truth is, is that I studied music and interpersonal communications when I was in college. Um, and, and truth be told, getting into the field of, of internet at all was not a thing when I was in college. In fact, I remember walking into um, a communications class as a freshman and our professor saying, have you all heard about this thing called the World Wide Web? And we hadn't. Um, so there was no way for me to even predict that I would end up in this field when I was uh, choosing my educational path. And at that time, I really, I had a million different jobs. Um, one of them that I always think has like stuck with me over the years was working at a car wash. Um, and I was the person at the end of the car wash that would talk to the customer after their car had been cleaned and upsell them to get their white walls done or their interior done. And I remember at the time, not really appreciating the job, but learning much later on in life, how very much that had contributed to who I was as a person in business development. Um, about 10 years ago, I started a small business with my partner at the time and uh, it was in the music field and no one had websites except they had MySpace pages and I needed to learn very quickly how to get people online and that's when I was introduced to WordPress. This was probably about 2005 and I started just by building my own WordPress websites um, and I was terrible to be fair. I was not a good developer, certainly wasn't a great designer, but I could do it. And that to me was very exciting. And that really began my transition into the tech space. So I took this knowledge of these random jobs I had from working at a car wash. I worked at Verizon selling yellow page ads and then took this new knowledge I had about creating websites and put them together to land really where I am today. So who am I am not? Because you know, I always think that this is something important to talk about it too. I'm not a great speller. I always point that out just in case there's a spelling error in the presentation. I'm calling it out now. Um, I certainly do not have all the answers. And I'm always happy to learn from everyone that I'm talking to as well. And as I mentioned, I would not consider myself a developer or a designer or a good slide maker for that matter, but I know enough about each of those things to talk about them when I'm working with clients. And it actually is important for me in my role in business development to be able to talk about code and to talk about design in a very logical and sensible way. I should mention that I work for a company called Web Dev Studios. Web Dev Studios has been around for 12 years now. Um, and always we've specialized in WordPress, but of course, you know, WordPress integrates with so many other technologies. We've had the pleasure of working with a number of them. Um, and I've been with Web Dev now for four years. Prior to that, I was with a company here in Philadelphia called Yikes. And I was with them for five years doing the same role, essentially, uh, sales, business development, and marketing. So I want to jump in and I want to talk about sales because I think that sales gets a bad rap. And we, um, you know, button it up and call it pretty things like business development. But at the end of the day, what we are doing is sales. Now, if you were to look up the real definition of sales right now online, it would say it's the exchange of a commodity for money, the action 
of selling something. Cool, that's a great definition. Uh, certainly, uh, to me, exemplifies what sales is. But I want to alter that definition a little bit. I want to just change it slightly so we can start to think about this as something that is positive. Because truth be told, if you were to ask somebody what they think of when they hear the word sales, um, some of the words that come to mind would be like pushy, annoying, slimy, manipulative. And while that is true for some people, it is a generalization. Really, what are we doing when we are selling? We are providing solutions to challenges a client might be having. And in our agency world, we need to be respectful of their budget. And that is the way that I am viewing sales. What I am doing is just providing a solution to a challenge that you may have. Now think about this in, a, in another context. If you had, let's say, um, to mow your lawn, and you didn't have a lawnmower and your neighbor came over and they lent you their lawnmower to mow their lawn, you would be grateful. You had a problem, somebody offered a solution, things got done. When we start to put money to it, when we start to exchange currency for those things, it becomes something that doesn't feel maybe quite right, but it shouldn't because what we're doing is providing solutions. All right. So what is an enterprise client? We understand sales now and kind of the basis for that. Let's talk about what an enterprise is. So these are some of my top clients in the enterprise space that I work with. Viacom, we all know, Microsoft, Campbell's, NBA. Now, you might be thinking, what could these companies possibly need an agency um, for to deliver them a CMS? The truth is, is that um, content management systems have a very important role in a lot of these enterprise level agencies because content of course is king. Um, and also the ability to have a team to do this effectively in house becomes slightly cost prohibitive. So you bring in an agency to kind of support the efforts that you already have in place with your IT team. And that is how I work with each of these individual clients that you're seeing here. Oops, skip to slide. So let's talk about the basics. When you're working with an enterprise client, what are the basics when it comes to this sale? Well, number one, it's a long sales cycle. That's just inevitable. There are some clients that I will talk to for a year, perhaps maybe even two years until they're ready to move forward with the project. I have just accepted that to be true and understand that I am going to work and build my pipeline over many, many months. I also know that I'm, when I'm working with somebody at this level, there are multiple people and multiple departments that I need to work with. It is never a singular point of contact. There are marketing departments, IT departments, there's content departments. Um, and so I need to be comfortable in my role as a facilitator to bring all of these groups and agencies together. Again, when you're working at this level too, it is never gonna just be a one-off project. Uh, it's not like a client like Viacom is gonna come to you and say, I need one website. That doesn't happen. They have networks of site. They have interfaces. They need a long-term partner to collaborate with on their infrastructure. And so anytime you're working with one of these clients, that's how you should be thinking, never thinking one-off. Um, again, to that point, there's no way, I mean, flat rate estimates, I think are, I hopefully, <laughs> are a thing of the past now, and we can move past them. We want to be thinking more retainer-based engagements with clients so we can lean more agile in our work with them. Um, it is also inevitable that when you are working with a large client, you are going to invest more time up front to get that sale. Now, this side note should be tracked and you should understand the length of the time for the investment that it is gonna get take to get one of these clients. You also have to be willing to travel. You have to go see them face to face, which is awful for me to say right now. And I realize that because we don't have that ability. We're leaning on virtual tools to bring everybody together. And that is working beautifully, as beautifully as it can right now. Um, however, I am maybe old school in my thinking that nothing can replace sitting face to face with somebody um, and being able to communicate with them. I also think when you're doing this, it is a team effort. 
It is never a singular job. While my title may be director of business development, to me, that is meaningless. I am really just a spokesperson for our team of 40 people. And that's very much how I use my job. I view my job. I could not do this alone. I need all of them. I need my director of engineering. I need the director of project management. It is always a group effort when we are going in to make one of these sales. So let's talk about the needs because I believe very much that enterprise clients have some different and very specific needs when it comes to um, their web infrastructures. Number one, they need to be scalable, which is why specifically an open source CMX um, is something that is such a benefit and an asset to this group of individuals because it needs to scale. You need to have multiple people being able to contribute to grow this into what they ultimately need for their infrastructure. Obviously, security is a concern, and this is where you start to hear people be a little bit wavering when it comes to open source. Can open source be as secure as proprietary? And of course it can. We all know that answer. Um, you work together with your web hosts, you work together with the IT folks, um, your sysadmins, to make sure that security is um, something that you are thinking about. But this is something that every enterprise client I've ever worked with has um, a brochure of things that need to be followed when it comes to security. You need to make sure that it integrates easily with all the things, whatever solution you're providing them. They typically have a number of third-party tools that they're using, whether it be for SEO, for analytics, to bring in other data from other parts of their organization into a website. And so this is, again, when you are using something that is open source and there is API capabilities, it makes this a little bit easier. Um, we're in a global age, so anybody at this level obviously is going to have some localization um, and multilingual needs, and so that's something to consider. And I think recently what I've learned, and, it, and I mean it's, um, I, I shouldn't say recently what I've learned, but something we've been focusing on a lot more now is the user flow for the content management system. While the user stories for the front end are very important, and we all know that, I very much believe that we should be also doing user stories for the operational workflow in the CMS of their choice. How do they manage content? How do they manipulate content? What are their needs? How can we customize this operational workflow in the CMS to be something that benefits them as an organization? And that to me is just as important as the front end of any website. So do user stories for your uh, admins, your editors, your content creators, um, and you will find and learn so much about the way that your clients actually use their websites. Your team needs to be flexible because we know that when we're working with a client, they like to change things up on a pretty regular basis. So how do you bend to those, to those changes that they're making without compromising timelines, budget, and the integrity of the project? Um, and that is all about being flexible. You do what you can to be the best partner, um, but you can also say no. Project management is essential. We talked about the fact that there's going to be multiple people working on this project and multiple departments. So having a thorough project manager that can really facilitate all of these parties coming together becomes crucial. And there, and you know, goes right to that next point of structure and timelines, making sure that the project manager is following those. Um, and also, I, I throw this in as like a little caveat. If you are working with enterprise clients now, or you're going to start, you need to understand off the bat that their invoicing and billing is a different world. Um, sometimes it's net 30, sometimes it's net 90, it could be net 120. Um, they could offer discounts to get shorter payment terms. Whatever it is, you do need to be open and flexible to that. Um, and you also have the ability to negotiate with them, but you also need to know that your team can handle it. If it's net 120, can you survive that long without getting that cash flow? And that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. All right, so when we, you know, we understand what this enterprise client looks like, we understand the sales aspect, we know what their needs are. Now, how do we start to get ready to pitch to them? And that really comes down to researching and planning. You have to understand your client 
as best that you can. And in order to do that, you're of course researching competitors. Um, I think it's very important to learn their current environment. This goes back a little bit to what we were talking about in terms of doing user flows for the admin, finding out how they manage content currently and what their challenges are, I think is essential in this piece. If they've given you an RFP or documentation or anything else, um, I, I deeply believe that people hide Easter eggs in these things all the time. And if you can catch it, you will be better off. Gather examples of work that you have done that is similar to this client. And if you can afford to, take the time to do a little baby amount of spec work. I'm talking one mock-up, perhaps a wireframe, maybe getting a site map in order based on your thoughts, if you are able to do that. And also, you have to be so clear in your communication when you're working with these clients. And I even say it again to be very clear. Um, I learned, I was a client recently for uh, an agency and I was getting very frustrated because this agency wasn't able to really deliver what it was that I was asking for. And it was during that time that I learned so much about communication with my own clients because, um, you know, perhaps my version of yellow might be different than your version of yellow. So if I say, give me a yellow background, we could be talking about two different things just because we're looking at the yellow differently. Um, and I think that that's really essential when we're talking to our clients, even though you may think that you understand what they're asking for, it's essential to go back in and clarify and get super specific. All right. This is one of my absolute favorite quotes when it pertains to sales. And that is the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And this goes back to what I was just saying about um, clarity. We think we've communicated. We think we've asked all the questions. And in reality, we have to understand that it is people's perception that is creating their reality. So when they're explaining something, it is based on their truth and not necessarily ours. And so how do we meet in the middle and truly understand what it is that they want? All right, so now we have researched, we have planned. It is time to start with proposing to a client of this size. Number one, you need to set expectations. I think I mentioned this later on in here, but I, I'm gonna say it again, because I think it warrants it. It is okay to say no to a client. It is okay to say parameters. We do not need to walk on eggshells with them. And we certainly don't need to say yes to everything. So setting expectations up front becomes crucial. If their timeline that they're asking for is unrealistic, tell them, come to a compromise that works. Do not promise anything that feels crazy to you because it will ruin the relationship. I think that goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I definitely believe that uh, most people don't take enough time to write a thoughtful proposal. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been in this situation, but you probably have a template for a proposal and you're copying it and you're getting it ready for another client and maybe you forget to change one part that was for the old client. Um, and it becomes messy. So while templates are great, and I think we all need them, I like to look at my proposal as a library of one sheets. So I have, you know, a variety of cover sheets, a variety of case studies. I have um, maybe a variety of, of sheets on how our process is, but the scope of actual services, the pricing page and the timeline are blank. And each one of those, I take the time to write for the client based on their goals. So when I'm writing a proposal and I understand that the client has given me, or I've asked for their goals and they've given me five goals for the project, let's say, my proposal is centered around those, how we're gonna address every one of those. So I'm gonna use just like a very broad example. If the goal was to get more people to fill out the contact form, let's say, that's goal number one. I'm putting that in the proposal and then underneath I am listing every solution that I'm offering them that is going to accomplish that goal. And that's how I'm setting it up because I want them to understand that I heard them, I understand their priorities, and that I took the time to cater this proposal to them. So um, this is a, a little bit of a WordPress line, but this goes for all CMS. We're never selling 
the tool, the technology. We're selling a solution and that solution happens to come with the technology. And that's how we should be thinking about it. So, you know, if we're talking to a client and they need a really great content management solution for editorial content, we want to show them that we're going to answer all of their goals for their editorial content. And the way that we're going to do that just happens to be Drupal or WordPress or whatever. It's kind of like a secondary because it's not the tech that's important. What's important is, is that we're solving their problem. Um, I definitely think it's important to focus on that ongoing relationship. And so not necessarily the price, even though we know that the price is important. The goal here is to build a partnership with that client. Uh, this is where I think most proposals go wrong and you must demonstrate value. I very much believe that when somebody says it's too expensive, it's not within my budget, whatever, it's not actually about the price unless they're like getting a grant that's like a flat rate. What I think that means to them is I'm not going to pay you this amount of money because I don't think it's worth it. Um, and so I very much, when somebody says to me, it's too expensive, I feel like I failed in demonstrating the value of the project to them. And I need to go back and reevaluate. Um, so I wouldn't think about it as setting a project and setting a price. I would think about it as here's my solution and this is what the return is going to be for you. And this is why it's worth it. Um, paid discovery is probably my favorite way to move forward with a project. I think estimates are incredibly difficult and I feel like no one has really figured out the right way to do estimates yet. It's still a bit of a mystery. And so if you have the ability to um, work with a client, especially at this level, and offer them a paid discovery option to really get into the nitty gritty of their project, at the end of that, they're going to get a much more thorough estimate and you will feel much more comfortable about the project. So if I could do this for anyone, paid discovery is the way that I'm gonna go. Um, again, I understand in a time of when we're all trying to be socially distant, uh, to do our best for the world. And again, that's amazing. Uh, once we can kind of uh, open the world back up again and we're able to be face to face with people, delivering proposals in person to me is just the hugest thing. And uh, even if you do this over Zoom, so this is what I do. I have a proposal ready for a client. I will email them and I will say, hey, I have some more questions that I'd like to ask, some more clarifying questions. Um, can we just jump on the phone so that we can talk about them a little bit? And then when I get them on the phone, I may or may not have questions, but I pull up the proposal and I go through it with them in real time because I could address their concerns, their questions, and when we get to a price, I can see their reaction instantly and talk to them about it there. The worst thing to do is just send a proposal wildly into the wind and expect that your client is going to read it correctly and be able to process the information in there because I can tell you without even knowing them, all they're gonna do is go to the pricing page, the timeline page, and that's probably it. And if you don't have the ability to address those concerns at that moment, in that moment, you're probably not gonna get too far with them. Um, this is just a quick slide I wanted to throw in here. Uh, if any of you have ever read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, um, it is certainly not a sales book, but to me, it is uh, the best sales book out there. If I could every day just live up to these four things, I feel like I have been, I do a very good job for, my, for myself and, and the folks that I work with. So just being impeccable with your word, not taking anything personally, not making assumptions, and of course, just always do your best. These are just the four rules that I try to live by in my role in business development. So remember um, a couple things, and I think that this first one is maybe one of the most important ones. When we talked about not taking anything personally, a client that you're working with, a good website project could make their career for them, especially at an enterprise level. If they hire you to build a network of sites or a marketing platform for their uh, organization and it is successful, they will look like a hero. Our clients have goals too. Be respectful of that. Not only do they have goals, they have bosses that they need to answer to as well. 
So when you are working with a client, understand that there is something that they will benefit from greatly from the project they are working on with you. Um, it's not always important that your customer is happy. People may disagree with that. You know, I think that their customer is always important, but I don't think that the customer is always right, nor are they always going to be happy. It's okay to have a little bit of tension. If you're being a true partner, you are pushing back on some things. You are the expert. You have positioned yourself as the expert and you are teaching your clients how to be a great client. And I will tell you that clients never remember how a project started. They'll never remember the sales cycle, but they will remember how that project ended. So just go out on a good note. Um, and again, yeah, no one goes to school to learn to be a client. So in your role as an agency, you are teaching your clients to be great clients. Couple tips for success. I know that people think they can multitask. You can't, it's been proven. Don't do it. If you are on the phone with a client, you're doing a video conference, whatever, turn off Slack, turn off Facebook, turn off all of that. Be present for your client. They will know. Use your camera. Choose your words wisely. Invoke action whenever you can. Always leave an email. Always leave a phone call with a question. Follow up. Be seen and be heard. Do presentations. Position yourself as an expert again. Write blog posts. Um, definitely use the CRM to keep yourself organized. Personally, I use HubSpot. I was using Copper, uh, which used to be ProsperWorks, but um, I'm now on HubSpot and I'm loving it. Stay informed. Uh, so for instance, when I'm entertaining a new client, I'll set up Google alerts for them. I'll even, if they mention to me that they're a Philadelphia Eagles fan, for instance, I will put that in their HubSpot ticket set a Google alert for maybe the Philadelphia Eagles. And if a fun article comes through, I'll send it to the client, not selling anything, just a little note to say, hey, I remember you mentioned this and I was thinking about you and I thought that this would be enjoyable. My new thing is um, I've been sending cheesesteaks from Gold Belly to all of my clients that are not in Philly because obviously Philadelphia is known for cheesesteaks and anytime I'm visiting with a client outside of Philly, they ask about cheesesteaks. Um, on so Gold Belly, you could get gym steaks and send them. And so that's what I've been doing. Um, I think for me, the, one of my golden rules is if a task takes less than two minutes to complete, do it immediately. So for instance, you get an email from a client and um, you may not be able to respond to it fully. Taking that five seconds to just say, hey, I received this. I wanted to acknowledge that. I am working on a comprehensive response but I just wanted to let you know, I got it. That goes a long way. Um, so again, if task takes less than two minutes, do it now. And then track and measure your results because that is the only way to improve. You actually wanna see your uh, the length of time it takes to get a client, go down. The cost to acquire a client, go down. Be efficient, get better at what you're doing. And the only way again to do that is to track and measure your results. Couple things that I found to be true, relationships are everything. Your team is a reflection of you. Your online world is important. And you're never too big, famous, good, or talented to do anything, get in the trenches. Uh, passion is important, but it's really determination that's what's gonna propel you forward. Motivation is kind of fleeting, but if you have a, if you're a regimen, if you're determined, you will get through it. You're gonna get tired, so please take care of yourself. And also never stop learning. And that's why you're all here, which I think is great. We're all learning together. A um, couple resources that I've used in putting together these presentations, a couple books that I love to sell as human by Daniel Pink, getting things done by David Allen, Allen game storming, game storming, sorry, by David Gray. This is a great book. If you're doing discovery sessions with clients or you want to do uh, user stories, it is a way of gamifying information that you're gaining from your clients. I mentioned the four agreements, um, influence the psychology of persuade, persuasion, um, and a great Ted talk by Amanda Palmer called the art of asking, which I think is really important to watch and learn about how asking and getting no's is okay. And there of course is also a link to web dev studios where I work. And that's my two puppies, Frankie and Aria, in their web dev hoodies. And here it is. This is the final slide. There is a link to my Twitter. It is at Jody underscore Riccelli. Uh, you can reach web dev studios at web dev studios. 
I am um, more than happy to continue talking to anyone. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Twitter's a very easy place to find me. Um, and it has been a pleasure and I'm certainly happy to answer questions now. All right, there we go. So anybody have questions? I think he unmuted all of the mics for everybody, right? Stan? Yeah. Hey, Jody, this is Alex from Apostrophe. I'm just wondering if you ever um, have experience with, like co-selling enterprise customers with CMS software companies um, where maybe you're bringing in like WordPress VIP or somewhere like the, the, you know, the, the services that are provided by them and how that's gone. That's a great question because um, I actually think that that is the best way to sell. So I see some folks from Pantheon on here today, Daryl and Joe, um, they're a partner of us and we talk about this too, right? Going in as a group, so um, I actually think an agency and a hosting company is a perfect relationship to go in and talk with an enterprise client. I think going in as a team, showing a comprehensive solution, uh, comprehensive solution is one of the most effective ways to win over a client. So I love the idea of working with partners and working with clients. You know, and also there is something to be said when you have um, an agency that specializes in something. So you have an agency that specializes in development. You have this agency that does, uh, specializes in hosting. You might have an agency that specializes in SEO or whatever. And they're all coming together to, um, you know, really present to this client. And the client sees like, hey, I have a team now. Like I have an army that's going to help me with this problem that I'm having. And that really is a beautiful thing. And especially if you're comfortable working together as partners, I think it makes it, you know, uh, much more successful for, for the client. So to me, if I could gather a village to go out from other agencies, that's always going to be my first choice, especially at this level of client. Because I will tell you, like, anytime I've went to visit with one of these clients, there's 10, 15 people in the room. Uh, and so I can't just go myself either, right? Because that's not going to look right. Um, oftentimes I'm meeting with C-level executives and they really have a team. So the more people I bring, um, you know, it, it looks more supported. And VIP does this very well, by the way. VIP, Adobe actually does it very well too. They go in in droves to these clients and sit with them and they're very successful. So I think, um, yes, I love doing it that way. I'll do it that way anytime that I can. And I actually think it is more successful. To be quite honest, I'm working on a white paper about this right now, actually, because I believe so much in it. Also, cool, uh, you. You, have, you have a question from Chris O'Donnell. It says, can you talk a little bit about how you secured the first meeting with the new client? Yeah, <clears throat> um, <laughs> so it depends on the client, obviously, but um, I'm pushy, so in a very nice way. So to me, until a client says, stop contacting me, I can still email. <laughs> that's how I feel <laughs> for a call. That's just my train of thought. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, so sometimes it has taken six months, a year for a client to just be like, I am really sick of hearing from you. So I'm just going to meet you. <laughs> I'm exhausted. You wore me out. I'll take it. <laughs> because I know when I get in front of them, it's going to be OK. You know, We'll have a nice conversation, and it'll be worth it. Um, so the, the thing I think is about framing what you're asking, right? You're not asking at the beginning, you're not asking for a sale at the beginning. You're just asking for the opportunity to meet them and learn about what they're doing as an organization or what they're doing as a business. Um, it is about understanding them as a, a enterprise level client or a person. If you're just talking to an individual. That's phase one. Let's just meet. Let's have coffee. Let's, um, you know, let me send you cheesesteaks. 
and we'll do a virtual lunch or whatever. I just want to have the opportunity to talk to you. So I think um, where sometimes things get a little skewed is when people are like, hey, I know you need work. Let's talk about the work first. No, you want to talk about the, the business first and what their needs are and then talk about what you could do in terms of the work. So um, I'm very persistent. I send a lot of emails. I also pick up the phone a lot, which I don't know if people still do that, but I do call people now. Um, and also uh, I use Sales Navigator on LinkedIn to show me sometimes how I'm connected to people so I can see if I can get an introduction that way. Um, but it is work. That is the thing. Getting that first meeting requires um, a strategic method of approach to these particular people um, and feeling confident enough in yourself that you can keep at it. It's hard. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's not easy. Also, I've done things where um, if there is somebody specific that I want to meet, I'll go to say like their Twitter and see if they're going to any comp again when we could be in around humans, if they were going to any conferences or anything like that. And I have no problems like showing up there. Um, because all I want to do is say hello. If I can get a hello, I'm okay. Thank you. I wish there always, was an easy answer. Yeah, I was, I was hoping you had a magic answer I hadn't tried before. It, it, it never works <laughs> out. It's always the same yeah. stuff. <laughs> I know, it is. It is always the same stuff. That's what, I, you know, I think there's like an art to business development because um, it really is just about methodical persistence. Yep. That's it. That's the secret. Awesome does anyone answer. have a magic answer? Because I'd love to hear it. <laughs> if somebody does. No, just have your winning personality and your uh, persistent methods. I think you're uh, you're awesome, Joey. This is Joe, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, you have to have good partners, though, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? Like, if you have strong partners, I right? We we help each other too. I agree. I, I loved your army. I'd love to have an army um, together. And I think that's your a little bit of your superpower too. It's like your Venn diagram just expands. Once you have a partner, now you've just got this much broader circle that you can influence. And then the more partners you have, you just keep you keep uh, expanding that, that um, range. So I really like that comment too and agree. You know, it's interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that was it. Um, I uh, have always thought, you know, of course we have agency partners or whatever, but last year we did a retreat for our agency for Web Dev Studios where all 40 of us got together in a house and spent the week together. And I thought, you know, I never really had the opportunity to talk about business development to everybody as a group here. And so I gave a whole presentation to everybody at Web Dev about how biz dev is really everyone's job at an agency. And I was really surprised to learn when I did that, that uh, people's views of going out and referring people were very skewed. And once I had the opportunity to break down what I would like them to do, which was, what I did was, as I said, these are our top three clients. These are our contacts at these top three clients. And I'm just gonna make up names. Like there's Mary, John, and Jeff. And you all know them and you love them and we work with them all the time. If you're out and about at a conference or whatever, and you meet somebody like Mary, John, or Jeff, just give them my email or tell them you're going to connect them with me. That's all that I want you to do. And when I broke it down like that and they understood a little bit more about what that ask was, they became very engaged in the business development process too. And that was super exciting to see. So now you have like your whole team finally understands how they can contribute to the success of the company by doing referrals. And that was just something I never considered before. And it is because people feel like uh, uneasy about saying, I want to refer you because you know, you're going to spend money. It goes back to that whole thing. So when we just broke it down in a different way, uh, everybody became so excited about like, I could help this person or I can help this person or I know a Mary. So let me introduce you to them. And that was a really cool thing to, and just again, building to your arsenal, adding to your army. Awesome story, Jody. Yeah. You just made an army of 40 right there overnight. 
your army just yeah. went awesome. Exactly. And it's just about kind of reframing how we think about biz dev a little bit. That's brilliant because that's been always been a challenge for me is getting like the developers to understand what they can do. I never thought of it that way. That that alone made this hour worth it. So. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was a huge thing. And it, the way that I, by the way, just a little side note on that, the way I came up with the clients and the people is I asked them to all give me their favorite clients and their favorite like person from those organizations that we work with. And I knew that I was going to get like an average and that's the people I use. And immediately everyone related like, oh, Mary, I love her. I get it. She runs the marketing department. She's in her thirties. She does X, Y, and Z. And then it started to like register. That's awesome. Yeah, my wheels are turning now. I want to just go internally and start doing the same thing. Yeah, listen, it was huge. I, I don't remember the name of it. I have to look it up, but I'm sure you can Google. There is a tool where you can insert polls into your Google slide deck and people can pull it up like on their phone from a website and vote and the answers display in the slide deck in real time. And that's how I worked with everybody. I was like, okay, all right, I want everybody to enter their favorite client. And then in real time, it, these bubbles popped up on the slide presentation and everybody got to see that they were leaning towards the same people. And it was really amazing to see everybody just say, oh, I got it. And I think that it, not even your agency or the people that you work with, just doing that with any group of people that you have starts to clarify things for people. It's just, again, reframing. We're just reframing. Wow. Awesome, Jody. This is Job. I got to check out. That was, uh, I'm, I'm going to go start running after this right now. <laughs> Thanks, Job. I was, I'm so glad you came. I appreciate it. Good to see your face. Good to hear your voice. You too. Job's from Pantheon, everybody. So I think they're your sponsor, right? I hope so. Yeah, I think you're. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have questions that I can answer? All right, well, if there are no questions, I'm gonna get this slide deck together so we can certainly share it out. And everything is linked in here, which you can click through. Again, any other questions that you might have, I'm 100% available to answer them. So you can see that my email address, my uh, Twitter handle is there. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to talk about this stuff at Wait, any time. Oh, there is one question. Uh, oh. He's asking, I was curious how you work with marketing. Uh, I can't pronounce your name, so I'm scared. I might get it wrong. Okay. No problem. I can answer that question, how I work with marketing. So uh, we have a brilliant content creator at Web Dev Studios. Her name is Laura Coronado, and she is responsible for all the great blogging that we do and our social media, and she does a ton of other things. But um, one of the things that she does incredibly well is uh, plan content. So how I enter into that often is it will be, you know, I'll say, okay, these couple of months, what we're doing right now, everybody is talking about um, uh, online training, right? The perfect, this is actually happening right now. Everybody wants to figure out how to get their training online because everybody's home. So what can we do to bring, uh, to build some kind of LMS, some online trading portal? And I'll hear it from clients for a month or two and I'll go to her and I'll say, Laura, um, everybody's asking about LMSs right now. I want to do like a content heavy push on LMSs immediately because that's obviously top of mind. Um, so that's one way that I work. So I'll take the feedback that I'm getting from clients as I'm talking to them, give that to her so that she can structure content around that. Um, there are also times where we'll learn a new technology, like when Headless was starting to be a thing and that was like a big deal for WordPress, you could do like headless installations or you could decouple WordPress and that was like a big deal. Um, when that happened and we had that new technology, it was like, let's push this because now that our engineers know how to do it, we want them to be able to work with clients on it. So let's figure out content, let's figure out a social media strategy, let's do something. Like let's get people's talks in order 
um, to, to, you know, specialize around headless or this decoupled instance or whatever. And, and let's push that. And that would be another way that I would work with her. So, and, and that's where engineering comes into play too. So we know we want to do something. Let's structure content that way. But the truth is when you are marketing at an enterprise level, it is not traditional marketing in any way. The most effective marketing is going to be for me to invest some money to send cheese steaks. I know I keep going back to that example, but you, I need to like entertain these clients a little bit more. The chances of like a Viacom falling in your lap from social media, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so it's a matter of me getting a list together, being very thoughtful about that list and how I want to target people on that list. Um, and, and then using funds to do that correctly, whether it be uh, gifts or visiting them in person or taking them out to dinner or whatever. Um, I was gonna say something else about that. What was that? Uh, oh, uh, I, we also found that our dev heavy blog posts get a lot of traction from folks that work in IT at these enterprise level clients. So if we do, for instance, write a blog post about a decoupled instance or the REST API or whatever, we're seeing people come in from like big organizations that are working in development, um, reading these blog posts. So we know that now that when we do a blog post that is engineer uh, development centric and written by engineers, we tend to get people from bigger organizations on our website. And that's also been very insightful because it's not something I would have considered. So then the trick is with marketing is how do you convert that traffic to these blog posts into a client? And uh, we're still working on perfecting that method, but we do have some strategic calls to actions there now. And we know that the blog is like really the section that's going to bring us the most to our website. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I need to remind you on um, there's two and a half minutes left. So if there's any left minute questions you can. Okay. I ask them and um, I have to move to the next panelist um, but this this webinar will still stay open but I just won't be here anymore to moderate okay all right, all right. thank you thank you for the presentation no problem thanks Dan and I think he left everybody's mics open so feel free with our last two minutes if you do have a question to ask uh, Yes, I'm Vas from Speed and Function, and I have a question: How you qualify clients? Don't waste time for some clients uh, that just uh, eat your brain, for example, and mm -hmm. uh, don't waste uh, time for uh, discovery and uh, even for R RFP. How you qualify them? Yeah, it's, uh, I also wish that there was like a magic solution to qualifying a client. Some of it is just from experience. Like I know there are certain things that I'll be able to look at right now, like in an RFP and understand that it's probably not going to be in our best interest. And, and also I will say this, I don't love RFPs. Um, there, I will do them if I have a connection at the, the company. So for instance, if it, let's say, you know, um, uh, NBC sends out an RFP. I want to know someone there that's connected to the process before I even entertain it. Because if not, I kind of just feel like it's a shot in the dark and it may not be worth my time. I mean, it may be, but it probably won't be. So um, I don't want to invest my time there unless I have a direct connection. Um, with other people who are spinning your wheels, if you can't get to a place where you can give them a proposal, then I go to that paid discovery option. And if they're just not open to that, they probably are not gonna be a great client. Um, and it, again, it goes back to being able to say no. If it doesn't feel right, and if you're, you feel like you're you know, running up against obstacles and hurdles that early on in the relationship with a client, you don't have to take everyone. You are better off spending or investing your time in clients that are giving you real-time feedback, who are engaged with you, who you think have potential to turn into a long-term partner. Now you may lose somebody that ended up being a successful client for somebody else. It's just part of the game and you, you have to be okay with that too. Um, and you have to do what feels right. You don't wanna put any stress on your team either 
like taking a project with an unrealistic timeline or an unrealistic budget is not going to help anyone. I've done that uh, quite honestly. Like I've taken a project where I've, I wanted just to make the sale and I knew that the timeline wasn't great. And I saw what that does to the team. And I never want to do that again. I never want to put them in, in that position again. So, you know, very much, I feel like, um, I am a mom in a way in the beginning, like what, how much can the team handle? What can I know? Can they do well? What's going to make this the best and most successful partnership overall? And sometimes that means having to cut people loose. Sometimes that means having to say no. And there's no point in spinning your wheels for an unprecedented amount of time for a client that you're unsure of. So I'm very much in the school of thought, like, you know, set, who are you trying to reach? Who's your target client? Go after them, get them and everybody else, you know, make the best call that you can for yourself. Sometimes you got to do something because you need the cash flow. And I understand that too. And I would never try to minimize the, the need for that. But um, it, if it doesn't feel right, it's not right. Like, like that's the short answer. I hope that helps. But. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, it looks like we're, it's at 9.55 and I want everybody to have enough time to get to their next session. Um, again, thank you for sticking with me for this first hour on a Friday. I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. The organizers at CMS Philly did a great job um, getting this to an online conference for today. So I know it's gonna be good for the rest of the day. Enjoy your Friday, enjoy your weekend. And I hope to talk to you more of you on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day.